It's U of L today on 93.9 The Ville. Here's your host, Mark Hebert. Welcome to U of L today with Mark Hebert on 93.9 The Ville. There aren't that many minority students going into teaching, and that is not a good thing. But the U of L College of Education and Human Development is working on it. Mikaika Overstreet and Amy Flint are both with the College of Education, and they're here to talk about recruiting and training more minority students to become teachers. Welcome, ladies. Thank you. Thank Good you. to see you. Yes, thanks. All right, well, tell us about this recruiting and teaching program to try and have more minority students become teachers at the University of Louisville. Sure. We have the uh, Minority Teacher Retention Program, Recruitment and Retention Program, <laughs> Okay. within um, the Early Childhood and Elementary Education Department. And so Makeka Overstreet is the director of that program, and it's been in place for about 30 years. Oh, wow. So it's been around a while. It's been around this is a, not long a newbie, time. Huh? This yeah. is not a new yeah. initiative. And we've worked with hundreds of students over those 30 years, of course. And one of the signature um, initiatives that we do with this program is we have state funding that supports minority students who want to be teachers in the state of Kentucky. Mm -hmm. So we support them with tuition. We support them through uh, Praxis Preparation, which is a, a test that they take. We support them through um, like job placement and interview help and, and that sort of thing, just to prepare students to be teachers in the state of Kentucky. So are you out recruiting them? Are you out scrambling, trying to convince, <laughs> convince these students to come to L as, as freshmen? They're undecided. They don't really know what they want to do. And they say, oh, I really don't really know what I want to do. Hey, how about becoming a teacher? <laughs> Absolutely. Is that Absolutely. what you're doing? Yes. Yeah, so we work to not only um, strengthen the pipeline of students coming into the program. So we're partnering with our local districts to sort of grow our own, build them you know, catch them while they're still in high school through ver various community groups like Black Achievers, Adelante Hispanic Achievers, and other programs such as that to try and encourage them to come into our program. But we also work within the student population at UofL, all those undecided students, the Office of Admissions and the Office for Diversity Admissions um, within within our uh, admissions department helps us to target students that are already at UofL as well. What's the problem we're trying to solve here? I mean, I said in my intro that there aren't enough African American and minority teachers right. is mm -hmm. that the, the bottom line and why not yes the problem is huge and i'm just going to read a couple of statistics okay. for yep. um, the audience so the state report card in 2015-16 reported that we have 3.7 percent black teachers in the state and this is um, in relationship to um 10.5 percent black students in the state and even within JCPS we have 36 percent black students in JCPS so we have a number of students of color who are not seeing teachers of color in their k-12 um, well let me ask you about Jefferson yeah. County so basically a third of the students in Jefferson mm -hmm. County public schools right. are African-American correct mm -hmm. What percentage of the teachers in Jefferson County Schools are African American? Um, I think that that number, um, if Makeka had pulled it up earlier. What's the ballpark? Well, I'll give me the ballpark. I wouldn't say around ten percent. About around ten percent. Okay. Yeah. So, so the so the problem is that the kids of color that are coming through the schools in Jefferson County and the rest of Kentucky are not seeing teachers that look like them. Correct. And in addition to that, even studies that have emerged in the past year have said that students of all races perceive students of color more positively um, and benefit from, I mean, perceive teachers of color more positively and benefit from having teachers of colors in the classroom. So it's a, it's a gift. Diversity, of course, is a gift for everyone, um, particularly, obviously, to students of color who aren't seeing themselves reflected in their teachers. Well, you've had this minority teacher recruitment program around for 30 years. Have you yes. seen an increase in the number of black students uh, coming to U of L saying, I want to be a teacher? Or are the numbers going down or not improving? We have. We have. The, the program has evolved somewhat over those 30 years in what we were doing um, as far as working with the students. At first, it was a, a much closer partnership with one district. So saying that it, this, this current version of it is not exactly the whole 30 years. But even since 2012, we've, we can steadily track that we've seen an increase in the number of students enrolled in our, pro our program from 30 to 40 per semester to now we're looking at 50 to 60 a semester. Well, that's good. So they're coming in. <laughs> they're coming in. They're, they're coming eventually. Right. Yeah. Well, Amy, what is the, well, I, I should say we're talking with Amy Flint and Makeka Overstreet from the University of Louisville's College of Education, and they work with the Minority Teacher Recruitment Program. What do you tell folk? What do you tell these students? 
Um, I, I, guess, I guess I should ask Makeka because <laughs> yes. you're yes. the director. Mm-hmm. And Makeka, by the way, for those of you listening on radio, she's African American. So uh, just so you know, um, what do you tell these students, and how do you convince them that they should be teachers? Well, we tell them we need you. And how and one of the things that I often start with, especially when I'm doing sort of a cold recruitment event, you know, I'm at a table mm-hmm. and this it's is at a some high sort of fair. Instance. Right. Okay. I asked them, I said, how many teachers of color have you had, you know, in elementary school? What about in middle school? What about in high school? And usually the students say none. Mm-hmm. Um, and if they do have ha- have had any, they say one. So I, and I say, you know, so that's what. I do. That's what we exist for. That's the problem that we're trying to fix. And that usually really drives the point home. But the students who want to come into the teaching program, the students that we are getting, are so passionate for very obvious reasons. They're saying, I had a teacher who did this for me, and I want to give back. I want students to have a different experience than I had. Sometimes it's I had a teacher who wasn't so great, Mm -hmm. and I want to give back. So the students are... I almost don't have to convince them. They know what the what the need is. And you're doing a lot of outreach in the high schools. So tell us about, there's a program with Seneca and some other high schools in Jefferson County that you're working with. What are you doing? Well, um, uh, JCPS has several education career academies, one of them being at Seneca. And um, just recently, we, for two semesters now, have had a closer partnership with the Education Career Academy at Seneca, the um, the uh, teacher over that program there and I have collaborated to sort of build a mentoring relationship between the MTRP students and the students at Seneca. Uh, coincidentally, this semester, her seniors were all students of color, and so it just seemed like a really serendipitous sort of matchup. So she and I matched up several of my minority teacher recruitment project students who are in our program to mentor her seniors. This They started um, corresponding via email, and then she brought them all to campus. They got to go to class with the um, MTRP students, get personalized campus tours, and it was just about the cutest thing I've ever seen. (laughs) The students were so excited, um, and just our students, the way they related to them, I know they're not Mm-hmm. babies they're high schoolers but they right. were so excited to be on campus and to talk to someone who really knew what it felt like my students are only a few years removed from mm-hmm. high school so they really knew what to show them that I wouldn't have thought of you know the inside of some of our cooler um, campus housing mm-hmm. those sort of things because they have friends who live the there stuff, right? so they got in there you know checked out the cool student apartments and but what they said again and again was how exciting the classes were, which some of the U of L students kind of laughed about. But they said, "We're talking about stuff we care about. Your teachers talk to you. You're having these active discussions. College is fun, mm-hmm. you know." So it that relationship is one we hope to continue, continue to um, allow our students to mentor their students. So if you get what four or five kids out of Seneca that enroll at U of L and go through the teacher training program, or even some other school, perhaps mm-hmm. Uh, mm-hmm. Uh, exactly. that's that's the goal here, right? That's exactly. Right. Mm-hmm. Okay. Yeah. Where do you hope this goes? Where do you hope this minority teacher training uh, program goes? What happens? Well, in two uh, years, I mean, magic wand, you can make it happen. <laughs> what happens? A couple of things. One, of course, we'd like to continue increasing the number of students that we are supporting through the program, as well as perhaps becoming a signature initiative for the College of Education, and that it becomes something that other universities look to to see how they might um, participate in better recruitment efforts for minority uh, students who want to be teachers. And, and, so, just, and just to make clear here, there's scholarship money available for all minority yes, candidates that want right. to be teachers, yes, right? Yes, and it, um, I think one thing that's important is that it goes beyond just the scholarship money. Of course, that's super important, but there is a sense of community and um, uh, relationship building that happens with the students, so they feel like they belong in the community and that happens through a lot of the outreach and support in terms of the praxis uh, preparation, the job placement interview, mock interviews, that kind of thing. So it's, the scholarship money is, is definitely important. But this is also a space for students to build a community. 
Dr. Tom Abel is the Shane Chair of Gastroenterology at the University of Louisville, and he's the director of a GI clinic at Jewish Hospital. And he's doing research on using electrical stimulation to solve some chronic gastric issues. So we're going to talk about stomach problems, right, Tom? You bet. All right. Well, Dr. Abel, thanks for being with us. I my, appreciate my, it. My pleasure. All right. Well, let's talk a little bit about uh, what problems do uh, those of us who are humans have with gastro issues, um, you know, nationwide, and, and what, what is the problem that you run across in your practice? Well, people have lots of problems, as you know, uh, swallowing, uh, digesting food, moving their bowels, uh, lots of problems. The particular one that we focused on a lot recently are people that have chronic nausea and vomiting, which is not a fun, popular topic to talk about, but in the human experience, everybody at some point has been nauseated or, and or vomited. Mm -hmm. can be from a viral illness, can be medication, surgery, can be any number of things. And usually it's a short-lived event. It's unpleasant, and we quickly forget unpleasant things. But some people have that chronically. Wow. Uh, and, uh, How many people have that chronic? That, that, that chronic? Probably at least 5 million people in the United States. Wow. That's so you're talking 5 million people are vomiting. Is that like on a daily basis? It, it <laughs> depends, but many of them uh, feel, feel like they're going to vomit. We call it nausea. Uh -huh. Uh, but a lot of them do vomit daily or almost daily. Wow. So, some, some vomit in cycles, which is, uh, can be related to disorders like migraine, which mm -hmm. affects up to 25% of the population. Migraine does. Right. And it's, uh, it's a rare complication of, of that. But uh, those people are, as you imagine, pretty miserable. They yeah, can't, yeah. They can't eat a normal diet. Ironically, they actually kind of gain weight because they can only eat carbohydrates, so they end up eating chips and things soda is just to, just to stay alive right uh, and, and uh, so so they're miserable and uh, unfortunately uh, just changing the diet often doesn't take care of it mm -hmm. and there's only one medication approved in the United States for this and it's not a medicine that can be taken safely long term so there's not a lot of options and, but is that the first thing most doctors do if, if I walk in and say man I've been I've been throwing up for the last month and a half and I, I, I don't get it and if they, they decide I'm chronic, the first thing they say is, well, we need to change your diet, and then they work towards medication, or how does that right. work? That's, that's the usual approach, right? And, uh -huh. and in the past, people thought that these were, quote, psychosomatic, because those people are oftentimes quite anxious and depressed, but uh, it oftentimes is, we've discovered, secondary to being sick. Wow. Okay. you imagine trying to live that way every day? And <laughs> no, I can't imagine and trying so to live that way. So much of our social life revolves around eating. If you mm -hmm. can't eat, you can't participate and you become isolated and kind of withdrawn. Mm. So it's uh, it's not a fun topic, but there are lots of lots of patients everywhere and a lot in this part of the country, in Kentucky, Kentuckyana. Right, right. All right, we're talking with Dr. Tom Abel, who's a gastroenterologist at the University of Louisville and runs a GI clinic at Jewish Hospital as well. So if if you're looking at these chronic problems, um, and it's called what, gastro something, paresis? Is that that's, that's one term, which literally means paralyzed stomach. Paralyzed stomach, okay. Uh, and so you've got that problem. You're vomiting on a routine basis. Nothing works. Diet doesn't work. Uh, medicine doesn't work. That one drug that you got that you talked about doesn't work. What's next? Well, uh, what we hope people will do next is try to uh, con contact us, and we work a lot with primary care physicians and tr try to suggest what to do. And uh, then uh, if, if their patient's still not better, person's still not better, we're happy to, s to see them. We, we, see, we, see, we get about 1,000 referrals a year, and sometimes it's discouraging for the patients because it can be a long time before we see them, but we also have other things we can do, other newer drugs that we're trying. We have a through the University of Louisville, we we're connected with the National Institute of Health and a protocol. And we also, for people that fail everything, we have a technique called electrical stimulation. Right. That's what I want to talk about, which is sure. really interesting. So describe, when you talk about electrical stimulation of the stomach, essentially, right. Right. What, what does that involve? What is it? Well, it, it's a technique that was developed uh, originally about 25 years ago on a team that I was at uh, down in Memphis, University of Memphis, uh, University of Tennessee in Memphis. And... Uh, uh, was first tried in an animal model and realized it might help some of these uh, patients. Uh, the way we do it is a little bit different than the approved way. We, we try it first, a uh, so-called try before you buy, and use an endoscope lighted to put down a couple of electrodes, 
run them through inside the your stomach, guts. In the inside okay. the stomach, run a couple of wires currently with a couple of wires through an external device, and we try that for about a week and see if the person gets better. And if they do, then we have a permanent device that's put in surgically by our surgical colleagues. How does electricity help with your stomach? Well, I, I think uh, uh, what happens is that uh, when you get uh, dis- normally vomiting is a normal reflex. If you eat the wrong thing and it's in- it's a, you get food poisoning or something. It's a normal reflex. Mm-hmm. It's abnormal when it's chronic, and uh, it involves neural pathways, just like with uh, seizures in the brain or cardiac arrhythmias in the heart. Everybody's familiar with that. It's, it's it's similar with the stomach. You get electrical dysfunction, and so the electrical like, stimulation can kind of normalize that disordered function. So it's kind of like having a defibrillator or something like that in your heart. or a Yeah, and some people have heard of what's used for Parkinson's disease, the tremor. It's an implant in the brain that actually won the Nobel Prize a couple of years ago. It's similar to that. It uses low dose of energy, and I, I view it in my simplistic way as kind of tickling the nerves, getting them to settle down and smile instead of frown. And this is called a gastric electrical stimulation, GES, right? Right. That's, okay. the, that's the term. How many folks have that? How many folks actually have something implanted in their stomach? Well, there are probably uh, well over 10,000 people in the world now. We, we, we do a lot here in Kentucky. We do about 10% of the world's implants here. So we see people from all over. Uh, but it's, uh, uh, it, it's a technique that we reserve only for those people that fail everything else. But for those people... It, has the potential to get them to eat more normally, hopefully not having to use tubes or IVs to stay stay alive. So it's a last-ditch kind of thing for folks who are having this chronic vomiting and, and, and problems. And does it work? Obviously, it, it works, it, or you wouldn't be implanting it, but yeah. does, does it completely cure the problem, or does it just make life better for these folks? It generally, it makes life better. It's, uh, uh, th- these disorders, uh, the most common cause that's recognized is diabetes, and we know the people that have diabetes have neuropathies, so it's a kind of diabetic neuropathy. But the non-diabetics also have neuropathies. That's part of the work that's come out of our National Institute of Health work. Okay. Almost 100% of these people have disordered anatomy, so if something's not right. All right. Uh, All right, well, something I w- wanted to ask you about, we only got about uh, two minutes left here, sure. but I want to get to you since I've got a gastroenterologist sitting in front of me here. What are okay. some of the things that you're seeing more of uh, in your practice um, with the heating, eating habits of folks and environmental hazards we've talked about on this show before. What sure. are some of the things that have kind of popped up maybe in the last 10 years as, in terms of gastro problems for Americans and folks living in Louisville? Well, it's, it, it's, a, it's a big topic. Uh, a lot of that relates to another uh, large issue, which is being, being overweight, which we all realize is not good. Uh, and that has that has a, f- a, a, a downside in just about every angle, from cancer to heartburn to, but but th- that's probably uh, a lot of driving a lot of what we see. We now, as we learn more, we realize that the the bacterial content, bacterial and viral content of the gut, is called the microbiome, is influenced by diet, and that's probably the new frontier is to understand that. Yeah, we've had a couple guests on our show to talk about that, about the gut bacteria and the right. role it plays, in, yeah. and uh, and actually you're in total health well-being, not just uh, what's in your gastrointestinal uh, tract. It's, it's, uh, and, and the old phrase, you are what you eat, is, is maybe brought home by that. Yeah. We realize a lot of chronic illnesses, again, I talked about Parkinson's earlier, but Parkinson's actually may begin in the gut, and then later shows up in the brain. It's Wow, really? I, didn't, I hadn't heard that one. That's yeah, interesting. Some, some of our patients with Parkinson's, for example, will be constipated for decades and then later develop the illness. Hmm. So that's uh, the, the nice thing about learning about this is we have the potential to intervene earlier right. and hopefully prevent people having to come to us late right. stage and needing Right, and UofL is doing devices. a lot of research on these uh, very important topics. True. Dr. Tom Abel, appreciate you being on the show. My pleasure. Sitting in front of me, Marie Kendall Brown, who's the Associate Director for Teaching, Learning, and Innovation at the Delphi Center at the University of Louisville, and Jeff Heeb, who's an Associate Professor in Engineering, been on the show before, and who's grabbed on to some new ways of teaching. So I hear, right? Jeff, is that correct? That is correct. All right. Well, we'll talk about your experience here in a minute. Uh, Marie, why don't you tell us a little bit about what, what is the TIL? That's what we're talking about today. What is it and what are you trying to do? Sure. Uh, first of all, thanks for having us. Sure. Glad you're here. The Teaching Innovation Learning Lab came about in response to the 21st Century Initiative. 
And it's an opportunity for our faculty to have a space here at UofL for innovation in their teaching. It's a classroom space. It's a gathering space. Uh, there's expert support from our instructional designers and our team to help faculty think about teaching in new ways. So this is a physical place, or is this a, a, a program of a new way of teaching? What is it? It is a, both. It's a physical space. It's on the third floor of Ekstrom Library. And what we've done is designed a large technology-enhanced active learning classroom where faculty can bring their students and experiment, and they have support to do so. So, Jeff, you're using this classroom. So how is this classroom different from a classroom you have over at the Speed School? So uh, we, at the Speed School, most of the classrooms are a traditional classroom that most people are got familiar a, got with. Got a blackboard? You still got yeah, blackboards? So we probably, okay. we do have some classrooms <laughs> that have blackboards. We uh, mostly, uh, they'll have projectors, digital projectors. Okay. And, and whatnot. But mostly you have sort of traditional classroom chairs in a row facing forward in the front of the room. So the till space is very different that there's small, there's tables, students sit in tables around and they kind of face projection screens and whiteboards. And there's really no front of the classroom. Okay. So I'm trying to envision this because I haven't been in this room. So I'm, so is it a round room and, or just a, with open desk or what, it's what a, is it? It's a rectangular room. So there's uh, when I teach in there, we run s we run six pods. So at each of those six stations, there's a, a television that students can project onto using um, the wireless internet, and then there's a station of maybe six or eight chairs. I usually use six chairs, so they work in about groups of six or seven, sitting at each one of those pods. And then there's three big projection screens that are sort of on the corners of the room, and whatever I want kind of tends to go up there. Do you use Pink Floyd music in the in the in the lab uh, to the, to kind of give the aroma and the, and the aura of uh, the right classroom experience or no? No, no? okay, no, no Pink Floyd. Okay. And, and the idea of the space is it is an experimental space. So the furniture moves. There's monitors. You can use any angle in terms of the front of the classroom. You can move the furniture. It really is a lab. It is for faculty to say, I have this idea. I want to try it out. I want to go and have some support in doing that, and it allows them to do that. Once again, we're talking about the Teaching Innovation Learning Lab, and a short uh, term is TILL, right, T-I-L-L, mm -hmm. uh, at the University of Louisville. What, is, what has been the reaction um, from the faculty? Have they said, yeah, I'm, we're going to flock to this place and give it, a, give it a go and see if we can learn something, or is Jeff the only one that showed up uh, for the TILL lab? Overwhelmingly positive. I think faculty are excited about the opportunity to innovate. They're excited about the space. Students who are in the space are really excited about it. It's new, it's novel, it's innovative. I think there's also some concern and some resistance. Faculty are, I think, traditional by and large, and the opportunity to be in a space where they're not the focal point and you know chairs aren't bolted down can be a little bit intimidating because we're asking them to reframe and re-envision their thinking. So I think it's a mix. I think faculty are excited, but also a little bit cautious. So Jeff, did you use this to set up like little pods of students where they can work together and you just kind of wander around the classroom? That's the, that's the vision I'm getting here. That, is that kind of what happens? That, that really is the vision. And, and that's really what's innovative about the space is that it creates that possibility. So I, I've been interested in what's called flipped classrooms for a number of years. And uh, I've been doing that in, I sort of started in a traditional space. And, and so I would uh, tried in a traditional space and it really didn't work, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, so mm -hmm. I kind of failed miserably for a year or two. And Speed School actually has a pilot classroom that, that has some similar aspects that the Till classroom has. It was really in this space where students face each other as opposed to facing me that I got them to do what it is that's supposed to kind of happen in a flipped classroom. Okay, we're talking with Jeff Heeb, who's a professor over at the uh, Speed School of Engineering at the University of Louisville, and we're also talking with Marie Kendall-Brown, who's at the Delphi Center, which is the teaching laboratory and the teaching arm uh, that teaches the teachers at the University of Louisville. Uh, so there, there, there's been some resistance. There's been some folks that have taken this on. In the end, what do you hope will happen? What do you hope will happen with this new lab? Sure. I think in the end, we hope to shift conversations about teaching and learning at the university. We want to re-envision the ways we teach. Uh, we want to be student-centered, promote student engagement, allowing students to do what they do best, ideally, in a learning environment, is to work together to learn. I think it's, it's about repositioning where students are in the equation and allowing them to collaborate in new ways. And we know that that enhances and fosters learning. So we want to encourage that 
in terms of conversations that are happening about teaching at the university. Has that worked, Jeff, in your classrooms that you've I, used there? I think it really has. So, so the idea behind it, what I do is the flipped classroom. So one of the ideas there, or the big idea of that is, sort of simply is, used to do, do outside of class what you used to do inside of class and do inside of class what you used to do outside of class. And really the motivation for that is that there's sort of three phases to designing and teaching a class. What are you going to teach? That's phase one, picking the content. That's obviously the instructors made one of their primary responsibilities. And in the traditional classroom, you would do phase two next, which is sort of information transfer. So students come to class, and I transfer that content to You stand them. up in front of the class, yeah. and you tell them, here's what you need to learn. Yeah. And, and, I, and I, you know, I did that for a number of years, and, and I liked it. And I think I was pretty good at it, to be mm -hmm. honest with you. Mm -hmm. And then phase three is what you would call maybe um, – I'll call knowledge knowledge construction or information acquisition. So it's it's taking that information and owning it and being able to use it. And in a traditional classroom, that's sort of what happens afterwards, and students do that on their own. And in the flipped classroom, you try to you basically try to move that knowledge construction and information acquisition phase into class where I'm available. And so, like I'm teaching in the till now, two days a week with with my class. And you know, I was trying to think about well, is it working? Am I getting there? And so I, was go, I go around, as you said, and I check with individual groups that are working on I just give my students sort of a set of problems. It's a calculus-based engineering math course. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I was going around checking with a group, and I'm like, you know, okay, John, how are you doing here? Because he's holding up this handheld whiteboard, which I just absolutely love. Like, I love them. They're one of the best pieces of technology in the till. I'm buying them for one of my classrooms that doesn't have them now. Handheld whiteboards. That, I didn't even I, know there were handheld yeah, whiteboards. Handheld whiteboards. Okay. And, and it's an amazing piece of technology. And he's standing there, and he, he clearly does not know how to work this problem. And I said, do you need some help? And he's like, no. Susan, Susan's got this. She's finishing working the problem. When she gets done, I'm going to have her get up at the board and explain it. And so in this little pod over in the corner of the room, students are teaching each other. They figured and, it out themselves. And, and Right. And, and it's, that's what I want to happen in the classroom. I want them to figure it out. And what's great is I'm there. So when they do hit something that they can't as a group resolve – that's when I come in and give that really high quality, and they're they're open, you know. They're, so I could say what I say at individual tables to the class as a whole, and it would just go nowhere. Well, Marie, we hear about um, teachers being reluctant to use technology, not just in college, but I mean all the way down to kindergarten level. Mm -hmm. That that kids these days, that's how they learn, right? Is through technology. So is that part of the part of the idea here is to get uh, professors uh, okay with technology and using different kinds of technology like handheld whiteboards uh, to teach? That's a great question. And yes, it is. And, and really, uh, the vision for the Teaching Innovation Learning Lab was a technology incubator, but we realized innovation isn't just about technology. Innovation could be about a handheld whiteboard. And so what we want faculty to think about is the ways that innovation can occur beyond maybe a traditional lecture. And there's many ways to do that. It could be small group activities. It can be muddiest point and classroom assessment techniques. But we want to stretch faculty or help them stretch and support them in innovating. And it could be technology, but it could be something simple like doing more uh, whiteboard activities. So I think there's a variety of ways of thinking about innovation, and that is what the space is designed for. Is it realistic to think that this will broaden beyond just this one laboratory on the University of Louisville campus? So, Jeff, your classroom over at the Speed School, uh, there may be five or six of them in the speed school and five or six of them in the, in the business school where people are learning this way and being more collaborative and student-centered? Sure, it is happening. Uh, we have seen a growth in these types of classrooms. We know at the School of Medicine they've done some significant classroom redesign to have classes like this. Other units are interested in this. And then also we are prepping for the opening of the academic classroom building in 2018 in the fall. That building will have many, if not most of the spaces, will be these types of classrooms. So we see the till as a precursor to that very exciting opening in August 18. Okay, very good. Well, thank you all for both uh, being on the show today and explaining what the till is. And it doesn't have anything to do with a farm I mean, field. No, it has everything to do with cultivating <laughs> but it, ideas. But it has to do with growing. It does yes. have to do. Oh, very good. <laughs> yes. Yeah, nice. Nicely done. Nicely done. All right. Well, thank you both for being on the program. Thank you all for listening. And go Cards. <laughs>